you would turn back in your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 as we're continuing to go through the book of Ephesians. Uh, I've covered the first four verses of this. We're going to try to uh, finish this section uh, today, verses 5 and 6. But we're going to read all six verses here for context. And if you would please stand in honor of God's word. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. So we've been working our way here in chapter 3 through this passage where Paul, as we see here, as we've read this morning in verse 6, reveals the mystery that he's been talking about here. As he's, even in chapter 1, intimated what that mystery was as far as the fulfillment of of Christ's death and resurrection was the joining together in one body of Jew and Gentile. That the Gentiles, as we studied back over in chapter 2 and there in verses 12 through the end of the chapter there, how that the Gentiles were no longer, had no hope, they no longer had no covenant, but that they were now part of God's eternal covenant plan of Jew and Gentile alike, redeemed by the blood of Christ in one body, which we call the church. And here in this particular section of Scripture, the Apostle Paul works through this, and he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, revealing his mindset regarding what he sees himself as in regards to service for Jesus Christ. It gives us an example as believers that we are prisoners of Christ. We've been released from the prison of sin, but we are now prisoners of Christ, gladly in his service. And we've talked several times about Paul loved the phrase being a bond slave of Christ. That's how he saw himself in regards to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, on behalf of you Gentiles, I've been called especially to service. And we know the calling of Paul back over in Acts chapter 9 about on the road to Damascus, how he was going to persecute Christians and how that the Lord stopped him there on the road. And then he called him, and the first thing he says there is that he is a, going to be a light for me. He is going to be my servant unto the Gentiles, to others, to the Jews also, and before kings, but first and foremost of all to the Gentiles. And then he says, I'm assuming that you've heard of this stewardship of God's grace. He was making the assumption that the Ephesians had heard of his calling by Christ for the service to the Gentiles by the grace of God. And then he says how this mystery was made known to me by revelation. He says, as I have written briefly, as we looked in chapter 2 there, and we talked there about revelation, the revelation that came by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to get back to 1 Corinthians 2 today, and in that chapter where Paul talks about that. But revelation, the apocalypsis, the revealing of what this mystery is. As he reveals here in verse 6, this joining together, this one body of Jew and Gentile in the church. And then he says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. And that word, as we said before, mysterion, and how we all love a good mystery, or many of us do anyway. Well, this is a mystery. The, The prophets had given, in the Old Testament, had given prophecy of Christ being a light unto the Gentiles, so they had some light into this that there was going to God was going to do a work among the Gentiles through Christ, but I don't believe that they had the full disclosure of this. And God 
in his sovereignty said, Paul, you are going to be the one that reveals all of this. Just like he said to John, you're going to be the one that reveals all of this or speaks all of this in the book of Revelation. God moves and calls men to speak those divine revelations. And this is what this is. This is a divine revelation, this mystery of Christ, of what he has been doing. And so he says here in verse 5, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. And so we see again, as I've spoken, God's sovereignty in not revealing this mystery to earlier generations of prophets and teachers of God's word. Even to those who spoke these things prophetically. Uh, concerning the bringing in of the Gentiles to the benefits of salvation. Now, especially we see in the Psalms, and especially in the book of Isaiah, you will see, and we've studied this before, that there are many prophecies there in Isaiah's writing concerning the bringing in of the Gentiles. But it wasn't fully made known to those prophets. And so we would need to remember this, that the, it's, it's that, that God chooses who he's going to have to do this. He didn't reveal it to Isaiah. He didn't reveal it to Jeremiah. He didn't reveal it to the apostles or these things until later on, until after the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. But what we find there when we get to the end of the Old Testament, if, if you know much about history there, is that there was a 400-year silence, the inter, what we call the intertestamental period between the Old Testament, between Malachi and then Matthew. What's going on in there? Is God not moving? Is God's plan on hold for a bit? No. Let me say this, that even at this time, even that the silences of God are just as ordained by God as when he speaks or moves. Sometimes in our lives as believers, we don't really feel the presence of God in us or we feel far away from God or it seems that God is silent. That doesn't mean that God is not doing anything in our lives. That doesn't mean that, that he's not moving to bring about his purposes in us. We just may not know all there is that he is doing. And so God didn't really speak through any prophets for over 400 years during that particular point in time. The nation of Israel eventually, as we know, fell under Roman rule, which led to the Israelites, as we say, having to be obedient to the decree of Caesar Augustus. What? That all the world should be taxed. And then that led to what? Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem, which led to what? To the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, which had been prophesied in Micah, which led what? to his sinless life and his perfect obedience to the Father, which led to what? Which led to Golgotha's brow, to his death upon the cross, and then eventually to his resurrection, and then his ascension back to the Father, and then to Pentecost, which brings us to the revelation of the mystery which Paul is going to reveal to the Ephesians in verse 6. So just because we might perceive God is not moving or speaking doesn't mean that he is not working to fulfill his purposes. Even in that 400 years of no prophets, God was moving the events of history to bring about his purpose. This is what he was doing. This was part of what we would call, as Peter on the day of Pentecost spoke of in Acts 2 and 23, he spoke of the determinate, the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. God's plan, God was moving in that direction. He was moving history along. And Paul himself said that this purpose, this mystery, as we Read last week, I believe it was, in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, he said that this mystery was of the secret and hidden wisdom of God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Do you think that Satan... And those under his control would have crucified Christ if they had understood or known this mystery that through these events that both Jew and Gentile would now be reconciled to God and that now there would be 
This fulfillment of the creation of the one body which is what? His church. Certainly not, Paul says. They would not have done this. Lawless men took Christ. They crucified him. But it was under the sovereign purpose of God prophesied by Isaiah the prophet. There in Isaiah 52 verse 15 all the way through Isaiah 53. God said, he prophesied, my servant's going to come. He's going to lay down his life. He's going to satisfy the righteous demands of the law there. And so we see this, and if you read through all of this, it speaks of how that God was not just passive in this. Yes, God does sometimes allow evil. We talked about this morning in Sunday school, and we saw this, how that very often when God's people, when you look back in the Old Testament in Israel, they would rebel against God. They would become wicked. Well, what did God do? He would very often send a wicked nation that would come along and would punish his people. Why? Because he loved them. Here, God does this for, for the purpose of saving the people that have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We look over there in chapter 53, as it says there in verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord, Yahweh, has laid on him the iniquity of his all. God the Father did that. He laid the iniquity upon the Son. We look a little farther down at verse 10. But yet it, is the, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. This was the doing of God. This was the sovereign purpose of God that he used wicked men to fulfill his purpose. And this, this counsel, this covenant between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit was decreed before the foundations of the world as that scripture says there before the ages, before the ages of time for our glory that you and I might have salvation and might be glorified one day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns again. And so this is what God did. And now he says here, Paul says, as it is now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So the mystery, once hidden, at least its full manifestation was not known has now been revealed. And the word for revealed here is much the same as the word for revelation. In the Greek, it is apokalupto, which literally means to remove a veil or covering, exposing to open view what was before hidden. I think about brides, okay? And how that very often, we've got some that are about to get married, okay? I can't remember if they're going to have a veil or not. Uh, I'm not going to embarrass her. But anyway... They come down the aisle. A veil is across their face, somewhat hidden. Here, the mystery has been somewhat veiled. Maybe not completely veiled because we had the prophecies. But then the bride arrives and the veil comes off. And the joy of the groom is that the beauty of the bride. Now the mystery has been unveiled. And it's a wonderful and a beautiful thing that God reveals here. When I thought about this unveiling, the revealing of the mystery concerning the bringing in of the Gentiles into this one body, the church, I, I thought about Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman. Now, Brother Weber, what does this have to do with Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well over there in John chapter 4, verse 23? Well, I'll let you know where I'm going with this. He says, he's having this conversation here. Now, the, the disciples, I'm sure, when you get to the first of chapter 4, the scripture there, I like how the old King James puts it. 
I don't use King James for the pulpit anymore. I still use it for some things. But it says Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Now, what did that mean? That means he had a providential divine appointment. He knew that this Samaritan woman was going to be sitting there at Jacob's well where that spring was when he created the world eons before. And he met her there. And so he's having this conversation with her. We find out she's got a checkered past. We know how it ends that she is, I believe, redeemed. I believe we'll meet her in heaven. So if you've got a checkered past, you don't get much more checkered than her past in this. But he says in this, and they're having this conversation, and he perceives that he is a prophet, and he says, she says, I know that Messiah is coming, and says, well, I that speak to you am he. And he says to her, she says, well, you Jews say that you have to worship in Jerusalem. We worship on this mountain, the Samaritans, but we say that, and you, you say you have to worship here. Jesus says this, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Jesus, as he's speaking here to her, knows the plan for the formation of the church and the bringing together of Jew and Gentile is about to occur. It's about to be fulfilled. All of the prophecies, the hour, he says here, is coming. And he knows that what is about to occur is the bringing together of Jew and Gentile in this one body, and they will worship together. The Samaritans will worship. The Romans will worship. The Jews will worship that are redeemed. People of every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation will worship together together in spirit and in truth in that. Now, why is that? How can that be? Whoever else is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb is going to worship together. And you look at a a group even such as ours this morning and so many different types of personalities and, 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 and levels of education and all of those things which really don't matter. What matters is that we come together in the spirit of God And our worship is in the spirit of God and around the truth of God. Let me say this, is that worship is not about, I mean, it's not centered around music. I love good gospel music. I love the singing of great hymns. But the worship of God is in the word or centered around the word that speaks of Christ to us. But Jesus says here to her, her, these people will worship in spirit. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is what he's talking about here. And the truth, the truth which is the word of God. Now the apostles didn't understand why I was talking to the Samaritan woman. Do you remember when he, they came back, they went into town to find some food. And they say, why is he talking to the Samaritan woman? I mean, it's almost sort of like I, I see the scene and I'm thinking, he's, they're thinking, do you know that this woman is Samaritan? Well, yeah, he knew this. He came there purposefully. But what we see in this is that after his death and resurrection, they would understand that Christ didn't come back to establish Israel as a kingdom or really a sovereign nation again, but he came back to purchase a people and to form one body, which is, and who is, I would say, the church. He came to redeem the church. Christ, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We think about that, those songs this this morning. He will hold me fast when he comes at last for the one that he has purchased by his blood that he purposed to purchase. To purchase these people that he told this Samaritan woman will worship together in spirit and in truth. And this is Christ's church that he came to die for. And it is being built. Let me say this. It is being built. The church is being built. Satan has tried with all of his minions and all of those under his control for these last 2,000 plus years to stop the church, but it just continues to grow. Because God has said, 
Christ has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. And what God purposes, we understand, we know you cannot stop and you cannot hinder. And he says that he revealed this to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. By the Spirit. Now, this has been given, as he says, the holy apostles and the prophets. And there's some division. As I did some study into this, as I looked at some of the different commentators, uh, or uncertainty as whether this was two different groups of people, or if Paul is really speaking of the apostles who were also given revelation. Apostles were also given revelation too. He's given a revelation right here. John was given a revelation. Is it two different groups? Uh, there are two different offices, it says in the scripture, that, uh, that are apostles and prophets. Now the apostles, as we've already talked about, were ones who must have seen the qualification for an apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 and 9 as one who saw the resurrected Christ. And some people would say, well, Paul never saw the resurrected Christ. Oh, yes, he did. You know how I know that? By the, the testimony of Scripture. Back over in Acts chapter 9. And there in verse 27, when Barnabas is bringing Paul here, to the apostles, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord. He saw the Lord. He saw the resurrected Lord by, I believe, the right hand of the Father there. And you know what? It doesn't say this in Scripture, but I believe that's why he was blind for three days because his eyes could not stand seeing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection and he was blinded for those three days so he did see Christ and so he took him there and then regarding the office of the prophet there's an office of the prophet that is spoken in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28 now most people when they think of a prophet they think of someone who it tells the foretells the future. And that's one of the definitions of a prophet. Prophetes is the, is the Greek word there. But it also means one who speaks openly before anyone and really in a technical term for an interpreter of a divine message. So it can be just the proclaiming of a divine message. And so, but, and, and, and so as I studied this, I looked at this and several of the commentators, including uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul, uh, he was a pretty good, he's a pretty good source, <laughs> uh, says that the construction of the words in the Greek could mean that one, that one of the, what it means here is that these apostles spoke these divine proclamations so he could, they could be both an apostle and one who was a prophet at the same time. But the emphasis is really not on whether this was one office or two offices. The emphasis is on the fact of whatever truth or revelation they spoke by what was by the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't dream these things up. John didn't dream these things up. Peter didn't dream, dream these things up. James didn't bring, dream these things up. They were given this truth by the Holy Spirit. And we talked about this somewhat back over in verse 3. And this, we have what we call revelation of truth and illumination of truth. Now, as I stated before, I do not believe that we're getting any new revelations of, Bib of Bible truth. In other words, declared truth from scriptures that we need to add to the 66 books that we're already getting. And be careful when somebody says, well, God told me this or God told me that, uh, then if they maybe they got an impression and that's what they mean of the Holy Spirit, but if it doesn't line up or it's contradictory to this book, they're speaking falsehood. They're not speaking the truth. But we also get illumination of divine truth is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Christ promised us that, did he not? If you go back to the book of John, and over there in chapters 14 and 15 and 16, he spoke of that when he was about to leave. He, his heart was heavy, but he said, I need, there's some things, apostles, that I need to tell you. There's some things that I need to teach you. And in chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, he says, I'm going to ask the Father. He is going to give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
And this comes, of course, I believe, on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has been with them, but now the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. He baptizes the church, and now the Holy Spirit dwells within the souls of every one of God's people so that we might know truth. This is when we study the Word of God, and I, and I say this as a pastor for those of you that teach the Word of God or if you're struggling with a passage of Scripture Ask the Holy Spirit. You are the Spirit of truth. Give me understanding in this doctrine. Give me understanding in this difficult passage of Scripture. No matter what your level of education, I believe that the Lord will reveal divine truth to His people because He has given us the Spirit of truth. You go down farther here in John 14 to verse 26. He says, These, excuse me, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. There were things that after the coming of the Holy Spirit that the apostles understood that they didn't understand before. Sometimes in our Christian growth, that happens. There are things very early on in our Christian immaturity that we do not understand. But over time, as we mature and we grow in our knowledge of God's Word, then the Holy Spirit reveals to us truth. He reveals to us the truth. If you go over to chapter 16 of John, and there in verse 13, he says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. So it is not natural knowledge that we speak the truth out of, but it is Holy Spirit knowledge. It is knowledge through the Holy Spirit, and that is what Paul is speaking about here. And so the holy apostles and the prophets were given special revelation to speak and write the truth of Scripture. Just as the Old Testament prophets, it says in 2 Peter 1 and 21, these men didn't speak these things on our own, but they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When they wrote these things and they spoke these things, it was speaking as Jesus said here, the Holy Spirit speaks really from the mind of God. It is the truth of God that is revealed. So the things written by John and Peter and Paul were by the revelation of God through the operation of the Holy Spirit. As we have read last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, that we, we don't speak the, the, the wisdom of men, but we speak by the understanding given to us by the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit teaches. And so as I said, any preacher, any pastor, teacher, any elder that studies and preaches, the first thing he should do, and this is one of the things, is is pray for the wisdom and help of the Holy Spirit. You must, you you better do that. Uh, One of the things right before I step into the pulpit, my favorite prayer is, God help me. (laughs) Help me. Give me understanding here that I speak clearly the truth of God's word and the understanding here that he has given me in my study of the scriptures. And that's what all of us should be doing. And then he says here in verse 6, he says this mystery here, here it is guys, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. We're members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Here the mystery is unveiled by Paul to the Ephesians that the Gentiles are full partakers with the redeemed Jews in this salvation and not only that but in the body which is the church. And what a marvelous thing this is for them to hear. And I don't know if up to this point they thought, well, we're just sort of a secondary type of group or not. But Paul is saying here, you are equal heirs. You are equal heirs in all of this, fellow heirs. Now, we, I think, all pretty much understand what an heir is and what that entails. If you're an heir... Sometimes, you know, I've seen this on TV shows. It didn't happen. Or you go to a lawyer's office and you sit down and the lawyer reads the will and you're the heir and or you have several heirs and they're all 
You know, here's what you get, and here's what you get, and here's what you get, if there's anything to get uh, in all of that. It means that somebody has died, has left us something, maybe something very valuable. Well, let me say this, somebody did die. The Lord Jesus Christ died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the grave, and he has left us a will. He has left us a will that tells us what we are an heir of. And we talked about this somewhat in Ephesians 1 and 11 where Paul says we have obtained an inheritance. Now sometimes when these wills are written and inheritance is involved, (laughs) some people get more than others. When that happens, in humanly speaking, among the sinful, you'll find out what people's natures are really like. But in God's economy, in his inheritance, guess what? We all get a great inheritance, the same inheritance. We get Christ. We get heaven. We get eternal life. We get glorification. Every single one of us get that. Amen. (laughs) And so with Christ heirs, we are all inheritors as the sons of God. I love, of course, the book of Romans. And we say, yeah, Brother Weber, uh, you love that Romans 8, 28 through 30. Well, I do love that one. But I also love Romans 8, 14 through 17, where it says there, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and as children than heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, fellow heirs with him. All that Christ has as far as heaven, we will have fellow heirs with Christ. Now, we are not going to be of the same nature of Christ. He's the eternal son of God. But all, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. I have an inheritance to prepare for you. Fellow heirs with Christ. And he says there that if children and these fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is part of our heirship. This is part of our inheritance is the glorification that we will receive when Christ appears. That's not all of it, but that's part of it. And he talks about this, Paul talks about it over in Galatians 3 and 29 and Galatians 4, 6 and 7 of our inheritance being heirs as sons of God. We inherit eternal life. We do inherit eternal life. We're told that in Matthew 19 and 29 and in Titus, over there in Titus 3 and 7. We inherit the kingdom of God. We're there and over in Matthew 25 and 34 where Jesus says to the ones over on his right hand, come and inherit the kingdom of God that I prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We inherit incorruption and glorification. As it speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that this corruptible must put on incorruption. And 1 John 3 and 3 says when we see him we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And in Romans 8 and 30 as part of the golden chain of God's eternal plan of salvation. The last part of that is glorification. We are promised that that's part of our inheritance as children, as sons of God. Also Part of what we inherit is, as Paul talks about, is that we are members of this same body. There's going to be one body, the church, that grows. It is a living thing. We get to be a part of that. As fellow heirs, this is what we inherit. There are not two bodies. There's not a Jewish body and a Gentile body, but one body. One united spiritual body of Christ, all bought by the blood, all saved to obey and glorify Him, and all saved to serve Him first in our fellow believers in Christ in the church until He comes again. Some people have the mistaken idea that being a Christian, being part of a church, is just so I can come and 
sit on a pew, and I can evaluate the, the worship leader, I can evaluate the music, or I can come here and be served and then go home. That's not what the church is for. Christ came and gave us the example as a servant to all that he ministered to in this life. It is not about the church. It's not about self-gratification. It is about living our lives to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and living our lives to glorify Him and to love one another and build one another up in the most holy faith. For me to encourage you as a child of God in your walk with God and for you to encourage me. You see, you've got a responsibility to me. I need encouragement. Usually about 6 p.m. on Sunday night or 8 a.m. on Monday morning. <laughs> but we, that's what we've been saved for. That's why Christ came and died in this. And he gives us a picture we had read this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul gives us a picture of what this body looks like and how the different giftings that we have. You've got a gift. I've got a gift. All God's people got a gift. <laughs> To serve the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a body where each member is doing his own thing. But we are doing our thing for Christ. Glorifying Him. Honoring Him. Serving one another. And then the last phrase that he uses here is partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now some of the, the, the versions have, and I like this, is... Uh, I think in the New American Standard in the Legacy Study Bible, the idea conveyed is that it's not, not only are we fellow heirs, but we are fellow partakers. Partakers of what? The promise in Christ. Jesus through the gospel. Now remember, for the Gentiles, they previously, as we look back, if you go back to chapter 2 there, and verses 12 and 13, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, that word but is a wonderful word. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, what's he talking about? What is this promise that is in Christ Jesus through the gospel? And I think the key is to understand that this promise is linked to the gospel. It is linked to the gospel. God has ordained the people to call, but he's ordained the means, and that is through the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. Nobody gets saved without the gospel. Nobody. All of the blessings we have are in Christ, which are many, and we become in Christ, as we've talked about this phrase before and the, what that all means, but we become in Christ when we believe the gospel that commands us to repent of our sins and believe by faith in his substitutionary blood sacrifice. When we do that, then we know that we are in Christ. His word has promised that. If I do what he says... If I have faith, I repent of my sins. You say, well, what, what about that repentance thing? We don't hear much about that anymore. Well, go back to Acts. The apostles didn't preach, say, hey, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Those 3,000, when they cried out, when he was preaching, what did he say? First word, repent. Repent. We repent. And we believe, and if you, want to go, if you want to check me out there, get your concordance and go back there and check the word repent and repentance, and it's all through the book of Acts there. It is there. The Apostle Paul said in one, I believe it's in Acts 20 and 21, that God commands men everywhere what? To repent. And when we repent and believe by faith in Christ, just like Abraham did. Abraham wasn't saved a different way. He believed in the promises of, he believed in the word of the Lord. He believed in Christ. I believe that and in that. And so this is what we're to believe. The gospel, which is God's power unto salvation, Paul said in Romans 1 and 16. And he talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I didn't come to baptize you guys. I came to preach the gospel, to preach Christ. That's what I came for. 
This is what we're to do. I put a quote out there on my Facebook page this week. It was a quote by Charles Spurgeon. And he says, if any preacher, basically I'm sure this is a paraphrase, if any preacher can preach a message and he doesn't mention Christ, that should be his last sermon. And that's the truth. If you don't preach Christ, you haven't preached. If you don't preach the gospel, if you can't preach the gospel, if you don't preach the gospel, if somebody, they need to quit. They need to stop doing that. But when we believe in him, when we believe the gospel, all the promises concerning eternal life, resurrection, justification, sanctification, glorification, the eternal love of God, we become partakers of all of that. That's what we have. If you're a child of God this morning, that's what you have. You are a partaker of all of that. And because we are now partakers, all of the blessings of being in Christ are, a, are ours. And there's so many, I can't name all of them, but I, I just went back to Ephesians 1 and 2 just to look at those. Because we are in Christ, we have, as he says in verse 3 of chapter 1, every spiritual blessing. In verse 5, he says, you have adoption as sons. In verse 7, he says, you have redemption through his blood. In verse 7, he also says, you have forgiveness of sins. In verse 11, he says, you have an eternal inheritance. In verse 14, he says, you, you are sealed as a guarantee of your salvation with the Holy Spirit. You are now, as it says in chapter 2 and verse 6, you are seated with Christ. Now we are have abundant grace, as he says there, overflowing, excelling grace in verse 7. Now we have in verse 14 of chapter 2, he says we have peace with God. In verse 16, he says you have reconciliation. This is part of being in Christ. Now in verse 18, he says you have access to the Father. And then we are being built collectively into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is what we have. This is what everyone who has ever believed the gospel by faith and is in Christ now, this is what you have. This is what you possess. This is what you are a partaker in as a child of God. This is what Paul was telling these Ephesian believers here, these Gentile believers. This is what you got. Rejoice. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because of what you have in this. And so the question I would ask this morning is do you have this assurance that the promises of forgiveness of sins and eternal life are yours? Are you a partaker? Are you a partaker of the blessings of Christ? And if you are not, then I would say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe the gospel. And you will know the blessed assurance of being a partaker in Christ. May we pray. Heavenly Father, when we think about all that we have as your children, how overwhelming it is. How mind-blowing it is to think of all that we have because of what you did in sending your Son to die upon the cross for our sins. Heavenly Father, may our praise be daily. May our thanks be daily. May our exaltation be daily of all that we have in Christ. And I pray today, Lord, that if there are those in this congregation today that are not partakers, that do not know Christ, that are not in Christ, then I pray today, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will come down, do a marvelous work in them, bring them from death to life, that they might believe by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. May we stand, please.